Canvas. Uh, five tips for optimizing your Canvas applications. So I, I know this is, this is terrible. The faces are just, they're scary and, <laughs> no, no, no. So I actually made it that way because I kind of wanted to show you guys and sort of give you a preface to like, if you have a badly optimized Canvas application, which this is, it's gonna look bad. It's gonna be choppy and uh, no one is gonna have fun using it. So I kind of wanted to get you guys in maybe a little bit of an angry mood. Um, so what do I mean by Canvas application? There's, there's a lot of cool things that you can do with the Canvas. You can you know, put a spinner on the page or you can make a banner. Uh, by application, I sort of mean something that has its own rendering loop. Something that happens asynchronous to the page, like uh, flipping Chris's and Singley's head across the page. Um, so yeah, uh, it sort of encompasses simulations, video players, uh, games, banners, whatever. Uh, so, so now what do I mean by optimize? Is he talking about how are we going to speed up our Canvas applications? And that's part of it, but you also sort of need to consider your performance requirements. You, you need to figure out where it's going to run. You could run Canvas uh, on a tablet or a mobile phone, or you can run it inside of a VM, which is what I'm currently inside of, or you can run it on like a sort of super powered box. So how are you going to handle that with a lot of different uh, rendering engines handling everything differently. So uh, one thing that you really need to make sure of is if Canvas is the correct tool for you. It doesn't have a lot of uh, native support for anything that you do and we do in a usual day. Like there's no text input place for it. And so if you're doing something that does text input or something uh, similar to that, you're, you're probably going to not want to actually use the Canvas and skip it as far as a platform to run on. So I'm going to give you guys a quick introduction to the Canvas itself. It's really easy. You put a Canvas tag on the page, and then you call document get element by ID, and then you grab the 2D context from it. You can, uh, there's actually sort of in beta, there's actually a way to grab a 3D context out of it and do a lot of 3D rendering. All of my examples are in 2D, and but a lot of the actual tips that I give you probably will work with 3D as well. So uh, first off, you can, uh, here's a few things you can do. You can draw like a, a scary image. <laughs> you can, uh, you know, put text on the screen. These are all different canvases that I've been drawing on. Uh, you can make an arc, you know, you can do boring, boring stuff like what Java 2D will give you. Um, and then there's, there's a few interesting things. You can actually get the image data off of the canvas. So say you rendered something onto it, and you want to save that as like a JPEG. You know, you can, you can pull the, the data, or, uh, and you can you know, maybe run like a filter over it that you custom wrote. Or if you want to uh, post it somewhere or to a web server, you can just call to data URL, and it'll actually make a URL that you can send off wherever you want. Uh, so let's get right into the tips. The first tip, code for your target audience. And I sort of mentioned already that you could have a, a bunch of different environments that you're going to be using the Canvas in. So everything current sort of supports it. Uh, now that IE9 supports it. Uh, Trident, IE's rendering engine, only just started it. And it does a lot of uh, hardware acceleration behind it. Um, Chrome and Firefox, they've They've supported it for a while, and Opera does uh, as well. So people will say, you know, it's, it's not really, it's sort of supported, but it's not really. And the only thing that's holding it up is this context draw system focus ring method. Apparently, no browsers really want to uh, implement when you tab into the canvas itself. So technically, everything else is implemented except for that. So. So let's get into the application loop. So sort of your brute force first pass at an application loop is you do an update where you simply update your model state. Maybe you're you know, handling mouse clicks or um, updating the position of heads flying across the screen. Or you're drawing at the same time. And I hope that anyone who's uh, looking at it and has done any sort of JavaScript knows the problem with this. The, the JavaScript execution engine shares the resources of the UI rendering thread on the browser. So when you get into such a tight loop like this, 
you're going to actually run these over and over and not give the UI thread enough time to update. So you're going to lock the browser, and it's going to say your script's been running for 20 seconds and not returning. Do you want to stop it? So that is bad. So then there's a better animation loop here, and it's uh, a little more interesting. I mean, you set an interval in JavaScript for it to run, and it'll run at a constant speed. And this is pretty good. This will get you through your you know, academic presentations or uh, some sort of small example. And part of the problem with this is that set interval will run every 10 milliseconds. If you have any application of any size, it might take your update might take a little longer than that. And all of the different JavaScript rendering or the JavaScript execution engines, you know, they can drop loops and they'll update kind of at random times. So you don't want to have um, you don't want to do this essentially. So in order to, to normalize that, essentially, you make a, uh, you sort of hold the elapsed time and then figure out, you send in the elapsed time to your update and you sort of see exactly what's going on based on the amount of time that's passed. So you can update, like, say, uh, Chris's head is going across the screen. And I want, and I updated in Drew in one millisecond. So I can calculate based on where the current state is, and then calculate the next uh, frame, and then set his head there. Uh, I guess I will show you an example. So let's go out of here. OK, so tip one example. So essentially, here, I'm grabbing the context, doing the initialization of the star field. Um, I'm drawing that animation loop demo start. And I'm probably going to skip this, because you all know it'll lock my browser, and it's going to be awful all around. So let's skip to the OK game loop. And um, so this is the one where we're not normalizing anything based on time. So we just simply call update, and then we call draw, and then you know we set another timeout afterwards so it doesn't drop any of its updates. So now that this is here, let's take a look at what happens. Okay, so I made a little bit of a star field example, and it, it runs pretty well. Um, you notice a little bit of uh, maybe jumpiness, but it, you know, it looks like a star field. So this is inside of my VM. So keep in mind this is the limited resources here, uh, the limited resources scenario here. But let's do, let's check it outside. Okay. Okay, so you can see it's going a little bit faster. So I, ultimately, we're getting a different experience inside of the VM versus outside of it. And my machine has a lot more power to put behind it than the VM does. So depending on what you're doing, like if you're moving a little game guy around, he'll move a lot faster in the Chrome. So let's actually take a look in IE and see how that happens. I mean, IE sucks, right? So <laughs> no, this is going to go really slow. Okay. Yeah, I mean, refer to my previous comment. IE sucks. And we're going. And it's not there. Okay. And we're opening things. Okay. That let's compare that side by side by Chrome. IE is actually rendering faster than Chrome here. That, that didn't blow everyone else away. Like, it blew me away. OK. <laughs> um, so why is this? Uh, you know, IE, actually, Microsoft is backing sort of a push to get your Canvas rendering backed by local hardware. So it, as a result, it can render a lot faster. And the drawing takes far less time than it does for Chrome. So that's, that's not normalized. So you know, in here, we're going to have a lot slower. Outside, we're going to have a lot faster. Let's go back in. Let's mess with the code a little more. OK. So here, we get the last draw time. We get the start draw time. We figured out how long it's been 
since the actual loops occurred, you, we update based on the elapsed time, and then we draw, you know, set some variables, and set a timeout. So this, as you may imagine, I, in the star field itself, you know, it'll run at the exact same speed because I'm updating the stars at the exact same time. Mm. It's pretty good. Um, this one's a little bit more jumpy, obviously, because it, it just doesn't have the resources to push out the graphics as much. But the, you'll, you'll get the same sort of experience. Uh, okay, let's, um, let's move along in Chrome out here, I guess. So tip two, always do the least amount possible. You know, as software developers, we always try to do the least amount possible to actually make our entire application you know, work. And if we're doing extra work, we don't need that code. So expensive update operations can possibly be uh, delayed. You know, uh, instead of maybe updating your AI and your game, you can, uh, every time the animation loop happens, you, know, you can try and update maybe every quarter of a second. So uh, sort of as an example, you know, if you update, so for, uh, for Chris's head, say uh, updating takes 25 seconds. And by updating, I mean sort of bounds checking outside to see if there's uh, something that I can put over here, um, and, uh, like deleting that memory location and, and uh, putting it back. Uh, and then drawing takes 15 milliseconds. And then interpolating itself, which is sort of predicting the next state of the system based on the current state also takes 15 milliseconds. And we give like a generous millisecond to the UI thread to update. Uh, that, that comes out to 51 milliseconds a frame. So you do a little dimensional analysis and you get 19.6 frames per second best case. And that's, you could tell that sucks. Like no one wants to play a game at 19 frames per second. Uh, so a little bit other concerns. Uh, jQuery, you know, underscore and prototype are useful, but they're actually really slow. One of the first things I noticed uh, in doing my application uh, to get Chris' head to fly across the screen is that I was doing a, cam a jQuery selector inside of the draw loop, and that just took a lot of time. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of time on page load, but it's being uh, iterated over all the time. So uh, I guess. JavaScript optimization 101, you sort of want to cache your local variables inside of your scope so that you don't have to go very far up the prototype chain or do a lot of array accessing. Um, so. so we want to make sure that we have a tight animation loop. So here, it looks OK. I mean, it's like kind of choppy and everything. So how, how do we make sure that we have a tight animation loop? Well, Chrome has a bunch of built-in tools in order to check. Um, to, to do a lot of profiling. So let's pull up the profiler here. And we'll record five, four, three, two, one, okay. Um, let's sort like reasonably. And I apologize for anyone in the back who can't see, but I'm sort of looking through the, uh, the profiled JavaScript code here. And I'll try and explain it as best I can. Oh my. I'll try and explain it as best I can. Essentially, it says my draw loop is taking up 93% of the actual application time. So that's, that's a lot. And we know it's doing a lot. So, so what's, the most, what's the biggest thing it's doing? It's doing a, a long update with interpolation. And I know that there's an expensive function inside, because I literally called it expensive function. <laughs> and it takes up 86% of the actual application. That is bad, and you can really, you can tell. So why don't we go inside of the code and see exactly what's going on here. Let's see, tip two. OK, so here we do this uh, long update with interpolation. And then we do the draw, similar to our other draw loops. Uh, so we, we definitely want to sort of mitigate the cost of this uh, long update. So instead of doing this, why don't we do below? So let's say we'll run the update every half second. So essentially, this long update with no interpolation, we sort of split out the, the interpolation part and the uh, updating part. 
uh, we figured out the elapsed time between the different updates and we run it every half second. I mean, this is pretty <laughs> trivial here. So let's go out and take a look at how much running that every half second works better. Okay, you can see it's a little bit smoother than it was before, but it still has that jumpiness. Now, if you really want to optimize this thing, you would get that expensive function out of there. But as far as the example goes, we kind of have to suffer with it in. So let's, now that it's running a little faster, let's see what the profiler says. Five, four, yeah, all right, it's done. Okay, so the actual time that the draw loop take it, has taken is cut down by, uh, you know, 30%. It only takes up a little bit more than half of your application and your long update, the expensive function is only 17% of your application. So essentially, you really want to delay any expensive operations inside of your uh, draw loop until they either have to happen or you have time to actually do them. Okay. So I just showed you the profiler. I didn't show anyone in the back because it was tough to see, but uh, the profiler is a, it's a good starting point for performance, but there, there's actually a lot of other things you need to consider while designing your application. It, it's sort of written for a memory agnostic environment. I was looking to do an encode memory profiler because I thought that might be a cool demo, but JavaScript doesn't have like a size of operator in uh, like C does. So no one cared when they designed JavaScript to, to do any uh, memory things. So you can get a lot of plugins for, uh, for doing JavaScript memory profiling in Firefox or Chrome or probably IEA didn't really work. Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, JavaScript has its own garbage collector, so you have to contend with that. Um, there's two guidelines that I got from the Apple developer site. Use the delete keyword, similar to freeing up pointers in C++ or C. And uh, use the var keyword. If you don't use the var keyword in JavaScript, it goes to the global scope, and you'll, it takes a long time to access that memory, especially inside of a draw loop. So, and also be wary of closures because they might contain hidden memory leaks. And here's like a really, really simple example of that. Can anyone in the back see just fine? Okay. So this is pretty simple. If you run this closure, if you even have this code in there, it's gonna start leaking an array and you have no access to it. And your app is gonna uh, slow down the browser itself and you know maybe crash the operating system if you're using IE and Windows or something. Um, also, frames per second. Frames per second is sort of the, the actual way that a lot of graphics applications can judge the speed at which they run on different, different builds. So, mix, and uh, y your frames per second are going to be slowest when you're updating a lot and drawing a lot, trivially. So let's actually take a look at that. So I'm back to the star field here, and I have this little text box down here which I can put the number of stars in. So let's see, we add more stars, we can have like a really dense star field. You know, we can really, really travel through a wormhole or at warp speed right here really fast. But okay, that's like kind of cool. And like you can start to see that it gets a little bit more jumpy as we start adding more stars into it. But you know, that's great to know, but how do we figure that out? So let's go ahead and uh, add um, the actual frames per second into it, and we can see, you know, what the different browsers, how the different browsers handle the frames per second. Okay, so a little bit of variable initialization. What I'm doing here is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to store, I'm going to cache the frames per second that we analyze in this last frames per second get the current frames per second and increment that every time we go through the loop here. Uh, obviously draw it onto the screen. And then every second here, we're going to figure out what the current frames per second is. And then we're going to uh, you know, reset the variables and, and cache the variables so that we can output it to the screen. So let's see, right now we're yeah, inside the VM in Firefox. Um, maybe I should save the file. And maybe I should be on the right example. 
Okay. So, you know, we're running at a good 40 frames per second here with a star field. Let's, uh, let's have a little more fun and put a lot more stars in. Okay, it totally goes down really quick. So what's going on? You know, it's drawing more stars. It's updating the positions of every single star every time. So it's going to slow down to 16 frames a second. Um, let's see, 15. Okay, let's see if we can't do a little better outside of the VM. Okay, that one has gone wild. Okay, so Chrome is handling this a little bit better. Uh, I don't know if anyone saw that, but at 50 stars, it's running at 104 frames per second. That's pretty good. That's pretty smooth for me. Okay, we add a lot, a few more stars. You know, 52. Let's add a lot more. See, see how many stars that this can handle before going down to 15 frames a second. 13, 15, I don't know, I'd guess about 2,500 or so, having done this once or twice. <laughs> okay, so about 2,000 and we're starting to approach the VM. So the VM obviously is really crappy and the frames per second is really slow. Let's check IE because we're all blown away, right, that IE was really good. Okay, this one's going to be good. Let me move, let me get back on that so I can have some memory. So this one, 172 frames a second for 50 stars. That was 33% uh, more than uh, Chrome could handle. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's IE, right? Okay, so 500 stars, we're already down to 45 frames per second. That is worse than Chrome, I agree. Um, part of the problem is, uh, you know, IE can render just fine. It's the JavaScript engine still really slow. So iterating over each of these stars and interpolating them every single time just takes too long and it really starts to degrade as soon as you're doing anything moderately interesting, especially with like a, a particle stream like this. So uh, let's try and throw, let's see, I guess, I guess we have a little bit of time. Let's see, try and pull it down to you know 20 frames per second. You know, Chrome could already handle 2,000. So let's see how long it takes to pull it down. Okay, all right, about 1,200. So it 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 all it really depends on what you're doing. But you know, IE can work in good situations, and Chrome will work in other situations, and it's a sad world, I suppose. Okay. So tip four, only draw what you need to draw. Um, it kind of goes without saying, like you don't want to do any extra drawing. And since drawing is such an expensive operation update, uh, um, it's such an expensive operation anyways, there's no reason that you want to do a lot more than you can, uh, more than you want to. So um, you, you might be able to get away with drawing image deltas, like if you know Link is swinging a sword or smiling or something, you, you can get away with that. But it starts to become non-trivial. Like, uh, it, it gets hard, especially when you have a lot of different things going on in your scene. The, the canvas itself is sort of a buffer bitmap. When you draw to the canvas, it, you essentially draw on it. And uh, so like if you draw a circle and then you draw a rectangle over it, the circle is going to go away because you sort of just change those bits in the bitmap and then you uh, drew over them. So you can, uh, y you'll lose things. It doesn't have support for layers. Um, also, uh, you can use the clear rectangle to clear anything away on the canvas, but it's, it's a little bit non-trivial, again, when you get a lot more, more things on the screen. So how do we do layers? Because you know a lot of stuff is going to be in layers. And, and how do we only clear what we need to? Uh, the canvases, you know, they're transparent by default, so sort of a, a trivial, naive solution, but it, it really works, is to you know, put two canvases on top of each other. Um, it, there's a little bit more overhead, obviously, because you're managing the context of all the different ones, but it can, if you do it correctly, it can add a lot of benefit. So here we are again, throwing everyone's head across the screen. And, and we have eight frames per second here, and uh, let's see, we're in Chrome native. 
So something's wrong here. And I actually set it up this way, because that expensive function that we had before is being called again. But this time, it's happening when we actually draw the background. So uh, essentially, I grab, I've already put the canvases on top of each other, and I kind of cheated just for the sake of expediency. I draw the long background onto the background context right here, but it's being drawn over right now. So every time we go through this uh, animation loop, you draw, uh, we do this update, and then we draw with the long background. So we draw the, draw the background over it, and then we draw everything on it. When we actually draw the background, um, I told you guys that it was a buffer bitmap. Drawing the background behind everything clears off the original, just it clears off what was previously drawn. So you get rid of the current state that it's in and you draw the background again. And then you draw all the images on top of it. So it, there's actually a lot happening and you can't really see it, especially, um, you, uh, I mean, at seven frames per second, you might be able to see it. Oh, this one gets four. No, but you, you can't really tell that the background and then everything else is being drawn every time. But so we're drawing with a long background here, but let's, uh, let's take that out. So we're drawing to the background context here, the initial background. And so we want to draw, but we don't want to draw with a background. So let's see what that does. Mm. Let's do it here. Okay, 31 frames a second. But like I said, we're not drawing the background. So we're not clearing what just came off of the canvas. And as a result, we're getting these kind of scary, bizarre trails behind everyone. Um, yeah. So how do we fix that? I mean, so. You, couldn't, you can't really just buy a little bit more. You have to, now we have to pay attention. Now anyone who read ahead really quickly saw where this was going. But so now every time a, an actual image is drawn, we erase where it was right before it. And so let's take a look on this screen here. Let's do it. Ugh, gotta get rid of that, it's nightmare stuff. And so now, we don't have to draw the expensive background, and we sort of get the added benefit of layers and being able to uh, not do the expensive operation. Okay, that's good news. Okay, so tip five, you, you wanna know the limitations and the advantages of the Canvas API, and this is sort of the speed thing. It's like, what draws faster where? Um, libraries can make things a lot easier for you. And if you don't want to get down into the nitty gritty, you can use these and they'll, most of them will have considered uh, these, a lot of this stuff already. Um, Impact.js is a library that you can use. Y you have to pay for it, but it actually comes with a lot of tools and a framework already there for you. So it's really easy to just start, it, get it up and running. Uh, Easel.js, as a paradigm that's similar to developing a Flash application. Anyone who's done action scripts you know, has had to deal with the stage and movie clips and, and all that. So if you know, you know JavaScript then action script, it's probably a good bridge. So is there a magic bullet to actually optimizing your application? Like, is there a process that I have that will just make everything really great for you in the future? Like, should you use vector graphics or images or make sure to not use alpha or anything. And unfortunately, if that was the case, I would have the patent on it already and I probably wouldn't be here. <laughs> so you have, to, you have to do a little bit of experimentation. And actually, this, I kind of like this experiment because every time I run it I, on a different browser, I get a lot of different results. So what I'm doing here is I'm figuring out, I'm graphing how long it takes to draw all these stars based on the number of time it takes to update. So sort of your x-axis is going to be the number of stars, and the time that it takes is going to be your y-axis. Now these little spikes up here, you can sort of see the, the garbage collector doing its thing, and it takes a little bit more time in order to uh, reclaim a lot of memory you know, during uh, execution. 
So that's moving along. Um, what I'm drawing right now is I'm not using alpha for the stars. So I'm sort of using uh, a gray, you know, black to white stars. And I'm not, I'm not using an image here. So um, let's go back down, increment, let's say decrement. So what, what, um, when you go back over the other data points, it sort of averages everything out into what it should be. It's uh, not summation. So you could sort of see it, you know, changing a little bit in here. But it's, it's mostly linear, and we have the max up here. So it takes 38 milliseconds for us to draw the, the stars here. So let's try something a little bit different. Let's turn off this auto increment here and go back to 1,000. OK, and let's try using, hey there. Let's try using alpha. So instead of being uh, white through black, instead it's a single shade of white, but with the alpha property adjusted. Um, I originally hypothesized that it would take a little bit more time to render something with alpha because you have to kind of calculate what's behind it and then add all of the pixels together. So let's do a little auto increment here. Let's see how it compares. Actually, let's do increment. And let's see how, uh, when we get it up a little bit higher, let's see how it compares to actually just drawing without alpha. OK. Let's move this a little faster. 15. So already we can see it's sort of approaching, taking a little bit more time. There we go. Okay, faster. Okay. It's already approaching, taking a, a little bit more time, but then actually drawing without alpha. But you know, it's still pretty even. I mean, this is a little. This is a non. This is a pretty negligible value that's going. Um, yeah, you kind of jumped. So let's say instead of you know actually rendering these circles, I mean circles, you know you got to calculate pi and colors and put them on the screen. So why don't we just use an image instead? So with a little bit more, it's the, uh, I lose a little bit of control doing these images based on you know figuring out what the actual alpha value is and like how dark each of them should be, but. I do get different data. So let's go down. So we're rendering these. So you can see at uh, 2300, Google Chrome actually renders at about the same speed as the uh, alpha here using images. So it's a little bit, uh, it's always kind of interesting to see what this comes out with. We could, and uh, I actually have the code online at GitHub if you want to look at it. I'm sure none of you do. <laughs> but <laughs> um, but uh, if you run this on IE, actually drawing the images takes far less time than actually calculating out the circle. So it's always, you know, it's always interesting to run these experiments. So anyways, in conclusion, Code for your target audience, you know, keep a tight animation loop. You'll benchmark your application using the relevant heuristics. Uh, only draw what you need to draw and uh, uh, know exactly what you're drawing, like uh, know the limitations and advantages of what you're doing with the application. So that's it. Thank you very much.